Good morning. My name is Al Houghton and welcome to The Word at Work. We are doing a school of the Holy Spirit where our chief goal is to walk in fullness of preparation and ready for whatever God wants to do. Now, that has grown into a challenge simply because the assignment in our generation is modified tremendously by the fact that it's the end times. And you've got several things that have come together to uh, expand what's expected of the end time generation. And so and as we started looking at the sonship gifts, because that's the foundation and the platform for really coming into the fullness of who Christ is without blame, shame, or guilt. So you have perfect faith and your spirit can germinate any promise so that nothing's impossible to you. I mean, that that is the path God took Saul of Tarsus as he transformed him. And it's the same path because God's no respecter of persons. It'll work for us. So uh, God has literally unfolded the key to the preparation to walk with him in the last days. And uh, we're committed to bringing that out uh, in this school. And so we have, uh, there are nine of those sonship gifts, Paul's own testimony about how God released him from his past and brought him into the fullness of faith with no blame, shame, or guilt. It's his own testimony. It's his own teaching. And number one was chosen, chosen, holy, and blameless are the first three, and that sets you up for the first major step in number uh, four is adoption. And adoptions where you and I literally become sons and daughters of God. I mean, we sort of change families. I mean, we're not abandoning the one we grew up in, but we are moving to the higher call of the family of the living God. Okay, well, as we move into that family, then there's some uh, solidifying and establishing that God does. And the first thing is that he makes us accepted and, uh, you know, then then redeemed and then forgiven. And all of a sudden, boom, we're established. And now several things open up. And one of the first things that opens up in Ephesians is the mystery of his will. And suddenly we see in the prophets, see what broadens our assignment if we're living in the last days is that the prophets, here's, here's one element, there are several, one element, the prophets have all declared there is coming a former and latter rain or a double, the, the double anointing as we see in uh, uh, Elijah and Eli in the transition from Elijah to Elisha. And Elisha comes up with a double. He lives in a double portion. But, and, and of course, the, the reason, one of the reasons is that uh, Jezebel nationally in that season had a dramatic impact on the church and God's answer was a double anointing and it was different for uh, Elisha. It is very different for the last days. Now, one of the second things that in addition to all that the prophets have said, I mean, and, and it's all confirmed in the New Testament. It's And James chapter five says, brethren, wait patiently for the former and the latter rain. Joel two is all about, I've given you the former rain faithfully. Now I'm bringing the former and the latter rain in the same season. Your vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. So, I mean, and here it is, there's a restoration. Yeah, God does a personal pala. And if you connect palas in the Old Testament, you realize that's the anointing that Moses walked in in Egypt. What the early church in Acts 4, they asked for three things when they com were commanded not to teach or speak in the name of Jesus. Give us boldness to obey in the face of threats. We're, we are not going to bow. God, you said speak. We have to speak. They can uh, make it illegal to speak, but we still have to speak. 
And that's how the early church reacted. They said, you, you choose whether it's right to obey you or God, but as for us, we don't have a choice. We have to obey God. Now, there's your government of God when it comes in conflict with corrupt government in the earth. The early church had to walk that battle. So they went to God and said, Lord, we need boldness. God gave them boldness. Extend your hand to heal. God extended his hand to how many? Really? You talk about extending your hand to heal? How about such a healing anointing on Peter that they people got in his shadow and got healed? Now, that's a healing anointing that is dramatic. And they had it in the early church. Well, they asked for a third thing. And most of the church today hadn't asked for that, doesn't even know it's available, and doesn't even have a theology to support it. But 40 years ago, God grabbed me by the collar and said, I'm going to take you upstream in Christianity. And I'm telling you, he started giving me the theology. So I got 40 years of theology. I have 40 years under my belt of walking with the judicial Christ. So the judgments of Egypt, I know Jesus the judge. I've walked with him. I've written three books about it. Uh, theology, theology, theology. It's all there. It's in the Bible. <laughs> but what do we see? In the second major, we've got the prophets, former and latter rain, but then we've got the introduction of the fullness of who God is. And we see this word called Pantocrator. <laughs> oh my, what a word. Oh, God is the... Uh, Pantocrator. Now, in Ephesians, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. Guess what Greek word that is? Cosmocrator, a world ruler of darkness. Now, a world ruler of darkness, that's really up here. I mean, that's major league demonic. And guess what the one word above that? The, the next Greek word that is absolutely above that, panto, crato, cosmo, crator, has to bow whenever panto, crator, steps on the scene. And what, what we are learning, because panto, crator is only used 10 times in the New Testament. It's used 58 times in the Bible altogether. Uh, Old Testament and New. And one of the shocking things is 31 of those in the Old Testament is <laughs> it's in the book of Job. So that there's a there's a message all of a sudden that you begin to see. To, see, nobody understood what was happening to Job, including Job. <laughs> I mean, his friends sure didn't, and they contributed to the problem. But Panto Crator was at work revealing himself to Job. And what was going on behind the scenes, if you remember the story of Job, is this battle between God and Satan. Satan accusing Job, he'll fold, he'll curse you to your face. Uh, you've blessed him. Take away the blessing, he'll curse you to fit. God said, no, no, he won't. I know Job. Job is a heart guy. What does God raise up in the last days? He raises up heart people. They're people of the spirit. They're people of the heart. Hallelujah. And because they're transformed, because they walk in Christ, because they're a new creation, because they learn to walk in the spirit, they can handle the adversity of the school of the spirit that prepares you to represent Pantocrat. There's no generation like the end time generation who has to face the animosity of Cosmocrator, demonic, demonic, world, demonic. James 5, the wicked, wealthy. I mean, I, I'm going to take the time to read about them today. But we are called... Book of Ephesians, it's the thread that went, runs through every chapter of Ephesians. We are called to represent the fullness of Christ in the last days 
And what that translates into when you go into the book of Revelation, that is, we have to represent Pantocrator, the universal rulership of God. There's nowhere that God doesn't rule or won't rule, even though the government may be corrupt. So we see a greater conflict between good and evil in the last days than ever before in human history. I mean, it is monumental, and the church is right in the middle of it, and God has declared that he's going, what Jesus died for is a harvest of nations, and he's going to get it. He's going to get it. But guess what it starts with? Guess what the open door to walking in all this is? It is sonship gift number two. <laughs> it's the, the It has a distinction. Of the nine sonship gifts, number two has a distinction. It is the only one that is a direct character transplant from God himself into our heart and life. When we are born again and become a new creation, the holiness of God is imparted to us. And it's in Christ. And it's in the Spirit. So we're talking about holiness, but guess what we've run into and, and why we have to spend the time. This is actually the uh, uh, second part, because I didn't get to finish last week, because the our Bible defines holiness and well, in really the the uh, the best place to to look at uh, this definition is when you get over to the book of Romans, because Romans actually, and I'm, I'll start today in Romans chapter two. So how how does the Bible define holiness? It's not of the letter. It's not of the law. See, one of the things that Jesus ran into, and he had to warn the disciples, beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees. And they thought it was because they brought no bread. Now, that was, and they remembered when he was uh, feeding the 5,000, they multiplied the loaves of meat. He said, beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees. What he was talking about was the hypocrisy. Everything they do, they do to be seen by men. True holiness, and, and this is where the church has such a battle with it today, because we have a history of legalistic holiness, which isn't holiness at all. And we almost want to take an eraser <laughs> and erase some of our experiences of the past um, that are based on encounters with legalistic holiness, because it is not the holiness that God imparts is in the spirit and it's not of the letter of the law. Jesus put it this way. I did not come to do away with the law and the prophets, but to fulfill. All right. How did he do that? Well, the, the New Testament has a solid redefinition of holiness in it. And there's a certain phrase that jumps off the page as we start to look at this. So I'm going to start in Romans chapter 2, verse 26. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? Now, that was unthinkable if you were Jewish because you, you had a covenant with God and, it, and that was your covenant, but it was all based on law and the reason it was based on law was to teach everybody that nobody could keep it. <laughs> they needed a savior because <laughs> everybody violates a law one time or another, <laughs> some a whole lot more than others. Anyway, verse 27, and will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law. See, is the issue having the law? No. 
is the issue keeping the law? No, nobody can do it. That's the whole reason why God instituted it, to prove to you that you can't do it. You need a Savior. <laughs> that, that, that was the whole rationale. That's why God did it. How he tells us why. Verse 28, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is that circumcision which was is outward in the flesh. <laughs> Holiness is not counting the number of righteous deeds you do. That's not counting a number of doing the right things and checking the right boxes and joining the right uh, church. It's not holiness is in the spirit. It's not in the flesh. Hallelujah. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart. Now catch this next phrase. Romans 2, 29. I'm going to read it again. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart in the the spirit of the heart in the spirit holiness of the heart in the spirit it's of the heart in the spirit it's it, <laughs> it's not outwardly in the flesh because everybody misses it everybody violates the law and uh, there's no way you can And that's highlighted by the fact that on the day, this is the pinnacle day in Moses' life, he led Israel out of Egypt. Every god of Egypt was judged in Pantocrator, proved he was Lord over them all. Every single one, I mean, 12, maybe I remember right, major judgments on Egypt. I mean, that was, and the whole purpose, go to the mountain of God, and I want to make you kings and priests. Exodus 19. And all the people said, sure, sure, sure. Okay. And then, chapter 20, here comes the fire. And the fire, God is a consuming fire. And the people saw the fire, and instead of running toward God, they ran away. Moses, such a deal we have for you. We'll pay you. I mean, somebody could die <laughs> in, in that atmosphere. God is fire. Yeah, he is fire. And that's right. What dies is your flesh. I mean, it's a that's all. This, you have to die to your flesh. But you do that by choosing the Holy Spirit. So in the spirit now becomes the dividing line of holiness versus flesh. So when you walk, and that's why now, if you go from Romans 2, and, and those which really makes it clear, I mean, who's a covenant person, who isn't? Your holiness is of the heart in the spirit. It's not your violations of it, because the blood of Jesus takes care of those. Already. So let's go to Romans 8. And let's look at one more confirming uh, word on the same subject. I mean, you got to love this because this is phase one of the Holy Spirit. And there's four phases here in Romans 8. And in phase one, he comes for one primary reason. The Holy Spirit is a gift. Remember John 14, in my Father's house are many mansions. If we're not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place, top us for you. Well, mansion, Monet, that first word, gets uh, defined in verse 23 of John 14. The Father and I will come. We will bring the Holy Spirit, and we will make our mansion in you. So you become the mansion of God or the temple of the living God. You become Mount Zion in Old Testament terminology. The temple. You become the temple. Hallelujah. All right, now, listen then to Romans 1, and we'll pick it up in verse 10. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, because that's what Christ died for. So if he's in you, 
you died to sin because Christ is in you. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, that's the whole reason why you say yes to the Holy Spirit, you receive the Holy Spirit, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Well, therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So what is the key phrase then for the holiness uh, dividing line of the heart in the Spirit? In the Spirit. In the spirit. Hallelujah. And so we said there were 24 in the spirit. If you have a new King James, the old new King James translation, <laughs> there is a newer one and it's a uh, very, very different. But the first one, the very first uh, King James translation, it has 24. And the first one of these comes in, um, of all places. Exodus 37, and, um, oh boy, can you, you talk about finding something interesting. Listen to this. This is the very first in the spirit, in the New King James translation, and it comes in Exodus 37. And from then, uh, we jump over to the New Testament. 37.1, the hand of the Lord came upon me, and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley and it was full of dry bones. And God said, can these bones live? And I said, I don't know. Okay, the key phrase here is in the spirit of the Lord because in the spirit has modifiers it picks up as we travel through the New Testament and it signals different dimensions and levels of anointing they become available to you and I by the Holy Spirit. And it's an issue of learning to walk in the Spirit and live in the Spirit and choose a life in the Spirit. Now, what makes this all um, really exciting for us is that we find ourselves, when it comes to issues in the Spirit, we have a whole lot in common with Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah, in his generation, had quite an encounter with the Lord. And one of the elements of uh, Jeremiah's encounter is very prominent for us in the last days. And what would that be? Well, God comes to Jeremiah, and he says in verse 4, Jeremiah 1-4, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, and I ordained you a prophet to the nation. I knew you. You were created for this. See, when we look at chosen, we found out something about chosen. God passed over many to get to us. Many are called. Few are chosen. Well, here we are in the end times. That doubles everything just because we're in the end times. And all of a sudden, we have to face the season becomes determinant that we were chosen because it's the winding up of the age. The intensity of it is multiplied beyond anything any previous generation has seen. So is the anointing. Just like the evil rises to a realm of fullness, God's answer fullness of Christ rises in the church. So what God said to Jeremiah now becomes a reality that you and I have to represent. Do not be afraid of their faces for I'm with you to deliver you says the Lord. That's in verse eight, Jeremiah one nine. Then the Lord put forth his hand, touched my mouth. The Lord said to me, behold, I put my words in your mouth. See, I've this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. 
Well, that's a pretty good description of Panto Krator. I mean, he, the God who is over all. He's the ruler over all. He's the God of rule, and he is the God who is determined to confront the rebellion of the sons of wickedness. And he's the God who's determined to get a harvest out of the generation. So nothing is off the table when you're representing Panto Krator. And Jeremiah had to learn that. And one of the things God said, do not diminish the word. Don't you pick and choose the things people want to hear. You tell it the way it is, Jeremiah. And that's what we're facing too. Okay, so the key phrase then for hol and holiness now, because of uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, which we have looked at. Come out from among them, be separate, says the Lord, and I will receive you. Okay, there's your holiness. Choose to uh, honor the holiness that God has imparted to us, and I will be your sons and daughters, and says, kurios pantocrator. So there is the God overall. The foundation for representing him is he, he is holy. And when you look at the second appearance of Panto Krator in the book of Revelation, it's in Revelation chapter uh, four, if I remember correctly. And it's the angels are told from this point on until the winding up of the age is complete, you will declare every single day, holy, 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 Lord God, Panto Krator. Holy, holy, holy. You declare holy, 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 because that's the platform from which God pleads with people to make Jesus Lord, where he is both the creator and the disposer. And we don't know what God's going to do and, until he tells us on the spot. We, we have to be ready. We're not representing us. It was up to us. I mean, we wouldn't do the judging thing. We completely bypassed that because that's a little scary to have to represent. So we would prefer to do it over, give the altar call for salvation. But Panto Krator is going to be who he wants to be, where he wants to be, when he wants to be. And for you and I, a walk in the spirit is to be fully yielded and ready to represent Panto Krator, whatever his desire of the moment is. Not up to us. This is not uh, this. You and I have to get completely out of ourselves. That's why a life in the spirit founded on the holiness of God is the open door to this whole realm. And Romans defines it as in the spirit and romans 8 says if the spirit of god rests in you then you are in the spirit romans 8 verse 9 is this very very clear hallelujah you have the holy spirit you're in the spirit god's definition so he's he is cheering us on to choose it whenever there's a conflict. Hallelujah. And trust that we will. We will grow into that dimension. So as we then uh, look at in the spirit in Luke chapter one, uh, we find another dimension gets added now to this sea because Ezekiel is in the spirit of the Lord and he's transported out to this valley of dry bones. Well, look at Luke 1, 17. He will also go before him, speaking of John the Baptist, in the spirit and power of Elijah. In the spirit and power of whoever God wants to release the spirit and power on, that's what you and I are going to go. And for John the Baptist, it was in the spirit and power of Elijah 
to to wind up and prepare the way of the Lord. Well, we're we will go in the spirit and power of the Lord Himself. We will be in the spirit and the power of Panto Krator. I mean, that far exceeds the spirit and power of Elijah. Panto Krator. He is God everywhere. He was a God in Egypt with Moses. He's a God of the end times with the church. That's different. That's a plateful. A little scary. Unless you get settled and established in your sonship and you know who you are in Christ. Then it's just another day at the office, so to speak. <laughs> yes and no, actually. <laughs> God has some days that are a lot more unique than others. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, God has some days that, man, if you got any hair, it'll be standing on end. So <laughs> uh, that is the glory of the Holy Spirit. You never know what he's going to do. And anything's by I guarantee it is not boring. Life in the spirit is not boring. Hallelujah. <laughs> but if you're going to walk there, you got to be fearless. And, and God gives us that. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh boy all right we're going to go to luke one and because one of these opens up in the prophecy that zacharias gives when he finally gets his voice back after john is born and this is a classic so i want to start there and that's in luke 167 now his father zacharias was filled with the holy spirit and prophesied saying Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us. Now he's talking about his son, John the Baptist. This is what my son's going to walk in. Now, if this sounds like a proud dad, you, you, you can see why. <laughs> in the house of his servant, David. Uh-oh, the house of David is back being rebuilt. You know what that means? As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets who have been since the world began that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers to remember his holy covenant the oath which he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. What? To perform. Now, this is the prophecy of what John the Baptist is ushering in. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers, the fullness of what he promised King David. Your seed, Jesus to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. Well, let me ask you something. Are you delivered from the hand of your enemy? Or do you, or do you have an enemy whose hand is oppressing you right now through one thing or another? Will you hear this? In the covenant that John the Baptist came to usher in that came through Christ, there is deliverance. There's deliverance from our enemies because God has a purpose for the end times. And that purpose is, listen to this, in holiness and righteousness to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. Verse 74, fearless. The church is fearless in the last days because they see God deliver them from their enemies. They see God, Panto Krator, comes on the scene to bring a deliverance, even if it's in your heart, you get delivered from fear. You're fearless in your heart. If you walk in the spirit, regardless, now see, that's what happened in the early church. The early church said, you can't preach. We're going to persecute you. We're going to throw you in jail. We're going to kill you. Well, they said boldness. 
anointing to heal all the judgments of Egypt. They got it. They got it. Did Herod kill James? Yes. How did God respond? Sent an angel who ate Herod with worms. Most painful death known to man in those days. Took three to five days for the worms to eat their way on the inside out. I mean, you died when they finally the worms appeared and finally got out. Oh, my gosh. That'd make you cry for morphine. Oops, hadn't invented it yet. Might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. That's what's prophesied. Is that available in the spirit? Yes, that's where boldness comes from. Boldness comes from the realm of the spirit. In the spirit and power of Elijah. In the spirit and the power of Jesus. When they're taking Jesus and Peter pulls out his sword. And <laughs> Jesus, put the sword away. I mean, you're resisting what God wants to do. There's a time for the sword. Go buy a sword. You're going to need sell your cloak. Buy a sword. You're going to need one. But it's not right now. You're going to need one, but that's not now. How how will the plan of salvation be executed if I'm not taken, Peter? Put your sword away. So he puts the ear back on the servant, and it's off to the crucifixion. But what does the covenant say? Deliverance from you know, fear can be a prison all its own. But deliverance from fear, being fearless in the last days, is a promise in the spirit and power of the Lord. In the spirit and power of Jesus, that's what the church is going to walk in in the last days. So this little phrase, in the spirit, becomes the open door because it's to the foundation, because the platform is built on holiness and walking there, and choosing there, and when when there's, and it's not the law. Holiness is a, it's in the spirit, is choosing God when there's a conflict between our flesh and what the Lord wants us to do. True holiness is obedience in the spirit, and the rest we have because of Jesus, what he bought and paid for and imparted. Hallelujah. And the blood of Christ continually cleanses us from sin as we go day to day. So learning to live in that realm, accepting that from the Lord, saying yes and walking there is what God has for the church in the days ahead. That's where we're going. Hallelujah. That's where we're going. And I'll tell you what, God is after it. Now, in the book of Galatians, we, we find this in the spirit pops up um, a number of times, and it's in Galatians 3, verses 1 through 3. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before his eyes, uh, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Your origin, you said yes. And in the spirit, you received everything. And God told you that's how you have to, you choose to walk in this. Your holiness is in the spirit. It's not bean counting. It's not joining the right organization. Having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Are you returning to the law? <laughs> Paul says, no, guys, you can't do that. You can't do that. All right, so you find it again over here. See, consistently, that is always a temptation to go back to the law, back to the law, back to the law. You got to resist that. I mean, twice in the Galatian church, we find that is a major, major issue. So it is again in Galatians 5 verses 16 through 18. I say then, walk in the spirit and you will, shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the spirit. 
For the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to the other, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you're led by the spirit, you are not under the law. When you're led by the spirit, you are free from the dictates of the law. Because in the spirit, you will satisfy the heart of righteousness. Of the heart in the spirit. of Not of the flesh. Not of whatever you're doing. Of the heart in the spirit is your foundation of holiness. It's spiritual. It's in your relationship with the Lord. Hallelujah. It's imparted to us. And we have to choose continually to stay there and walk there. And so 22 through 25 of Galatians, but the fruit of the spirits, love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such, there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Hallelujah. Great wisdom. And then you go over to uh, Ephesians 2 and listen to Ephesians 2.22. What is the Holy Spirit doing? Uh, well, I'm going to back it up and uh, pick up verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom, listen to this, in whom you are also being built together for habitation of God in the spirit. <laughs> What's the key to holiness? I mean, you have to change your thinking I mean, because most of us grew up, it was law, 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 do this, don't dance, don't go here, don't go there, don't do that. Come on, guys, cut the crap. Get, get to the heart of the word, because if you get established in the word, then you can walk this out the way God intended to. You are being built together a habitation of God in the spirit. That's where your holiness is. That's where your relationship with God is, which you want to maintain completely. Okay, so that is um, Ephesians 2, 22. Then you go over to 4, 23 through 24. Three times in the spirit appears in the book of Ephesians. So four, let's see, 23 and 24. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in righteousness and true holiness. Well, if there's a true holiness, guess what? There's a counterfeit. Yeah, the true holiness, it's all in the spirit, supplied in the spirit. And you can tell you're walking in the spirit because your actions are actions that reflect the holiness of God himself. And, and you get there by choosing the path, the witness of the Holy Spirit. And if there's a conflict, you go with what the Spirit is asking you to do. Finally, it's in Ephesians 6, 17 and 18. Ephesians 6, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. <laughs> What's the definition for praying in the Spirit? Praying in tongues. That's the definition. Praying in the... You're activating your spirit life when you're praying in tongues. And, the, and if you choose to build praying in tongues as a discipline in your life on a daily basis, ah, the reward is going to grow to the place where it's probably going to manifest daily. Now, can you imagine getting up in the very place where you're spending your time praying in the spirit? Then all of a sudden, here comes a revelation of God's word. Here comes the Holy Spirit to unfold something to you and to open up a realm you've never been in. And Oh, my gosh. You, so back here in the back of your mind, all this stuff is percolating. You wish you could tell people. But you have to wait for the right time. Oh, I've got a lot to say to you, but I can't say it now. You remember that? 
<laughs> that, that was Jesus in John 14. <laughs> Whoa. How would you like to live in that room? Oh, my gosh. Whoa. In the spirit. Listen to this. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Wow, look at how that put on the whole armor of God, pray in the spirit and watch what God's going to do and unfold top off moments in front of you that Jesus prepared before the foundations of the earth. You're going to represent Panto Krator. You're headed toward that fullness. That day is coming. So is the deliverance from your enemies. You get, When you recognize enemies, what do you do? You prophesy what you hear the Holy Spirit say. Woo, man, oh, man. Okay, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 8. I mean, what we're doing, we're walking through the New Testament over the issue of moving in the Spirit, which is the life flow that God has for us, and we have to choose to go there. Hallelujah. All right, let's see. Colossians chapter 1 who also declared to us your love in the spirit for this reason we also since the day we heard it do not cease to pray for you and that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may have a walk worthy of the lord fully pleasing him being fruitful in every good work increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who's qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Look, that's because you're walking in the spirit, because you're walking in the love of God in the realm of the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the inheritance is waiting for you and the Holy Spirit is taking you toward it. You're headed to it. You're going to find it. You're going to find the works that Jesus ordained before the foundations of the world for you to do. God has it for you. You're going to come into it. You have an inheritance and it's beyond our thinking. I mean, Sometimes it has to be constructed in the spirit before you and I ever get there. And that's why when you're praying in tongues, you're building in the realm of the spirit. And oftentimes you don't see what you're building until you hit the point of manifestation. Oh, what a divine wisdom Then you and I could have the ability and power to pray for something that we aren't even sure we need. And won't see it until it manifests. Wow. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the son of his love. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. Hallelujah. In the spirit. In the spirit. In the spirit. And what's amazing about in the spirit in Colossians 2 uh, 8, 9, and 10 is that what exists and has been bought and paid for by Christ, it's already blood bought in the spirit transitions from a place, a noun, an existence to a reality as you become the actions of the Holy Spirit. Beware lest anyone cheats you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are fullness, play Roma. In Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are play ro -o in him who is head of all principality and power. Wow. The Holy Spirit, nothing is impossible for the Holy Spirit, and nothing is impossible to you and I. But God has a will for us, a purpose and a plan 
for you and I to walk out. Sometimes walking out his purpose and plan means becoming an overcomer in great adversity. Sometimes you have to overcome health issues. Sometimes you there's an overcoming that God is bringing the church through. And every single church of Revelation has the same phrase in it. It's a little different promise to each one, but it's to him who overcomes, to him who overcomes, to him who overcomes. What do we know about walking in the Spirit? Walking in the Spirit opens up a realm of divine presence, energy, ability, not always bringing deliverance, but to overcome, to overcome and to fill the purpose for our life. That's what the early church had to do. They had to walk through tremendous adversity to birth what they had seen. And the majority of them, went out through martyrdom, but they were willing to face the adversity of the season. What do we know about the end times? It has some of the same things. We face unspeakable adversity, but by the spirit, we overcome to fulfill our call that's on our life in our generation. We overcome to fulfill. The power of the Holy Spirit comes to us to anoint us to fulfill. When we go over to uh, 1 Timothy, and it, it, it is amazing what we see about the life in the Spirit that the Lord has for us. And in... Um, First Timothy uh, 3, verse 16, here's what we're told. Well, I'm going to go back to 14. These things I write to you, um, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar of and ground of the truth, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit. So where is that foundation of holiness, and where does it exist? When we say yes to the Holy Spirit, we are fulfilling the holiness of God. We're walking out the holiness of God, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory, justified in the spirit. So that's where our uh, justification, our holiness comes. It comes with a walk in the spirit. And all through scripture, this truth it is really uh, poured forth for us so that when we get to the book of Revelation, it is four times in the book of Revelation. And what we come to in Revelation is that the only way that you and I can traverse and walk through the end times of Revelation, where we have to to represent Pantocrator, the one consistent theme is we have to do it in the spirit. You have to do it in the spirit. In other words, you and I have to be delivered from ourselves, totally, totally yielded over to God, given to his purpose and his plan, so that to the best of our ability, we are choosing life by the Holy Spirit who is in us, orchestrating, leading, guiding, and directing us toward God's purpose for us. So Revelation 1, uh, 9 and 10. I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and um, patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that's called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. 
I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. When you and I are in the spirit, what realm opens? When we choose the things of the spirit, what realm opens to us? Whatever the Lord has in that on that day, in that hour, in that moment, opens up to us. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet saying, I'm Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Wow. And, and I want you to write in a book. And so here comes the entire book of Revelation comes from the platform of being in the spirit. Now, if you're going to write something like this, it has to come from in the spirit. Well, what about if you have to walk out some of what's in here or parts and pieces of it? The only way to do that is the same. If you're going to walk it out, it has to be done in the spirit. Revelation 4, 1 and 2. After these things, I looked and behold, the door standing open in heaven. The first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Uh, immediately I was in the spirit. Does God have doorways that for you and I to walk through where the Holy Spirit comes to show us, either explains parts of his word we've never seen before, or he opens an understanding we've never had before? That's who God is. That's the job of the Holy Spirit, is to open his word, his will, his purpose, his plan for us to bring us into peace, to strengthen us, to deliver us, to, to give us a platform to walk with him into what Jesus saw for us before the foundations of the earth. Hallelujah. And where, where is it accomplished? In the spirit. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And out comes the book of Revelation. Does God, ha God has moments of in the spirit for every single one of us. They're probably not as dramatic as this, but for us, they open things, purpose, plan. They have answers. They, um, they soothe your spirit. They calm the storm. Revelation 17, starting in verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying, Come and I will show you the judgment and great harlot who sits on many waters. With him the kings of the earth committed fornication, and inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy. He's seeing the culture as it's about to unfold in front of him and what God's going to do, what God's response is. See, in the spirit, you can see, here's what I'm going to do. Get ready. Here's what I'm going to do with you. Here's what I want you to say. You're going to go here. You're going to have a great harvest. Here's what, here's what I'm in the spirit. Our life unfolds through the mystery of God's will in the spirit in order for you and I to accomplish what God ordained for us before we were ever born, before ever one thing was written in the book about what you and I would accomplish. It was in God's heart and the Holy Spirit was tasked with unfolding it for us and marching us into it whether we construct it when we're praying and wait for it to manifest or whether we just wander into all of a sudden, here comes a manifestation of it. the Holy Spirit is tasked with getting us to our destiny and he will not fail until we achieve what God created us for. If we choose to walk in and by his Holy Spirit. And finally, Revelation 21.10. 
the last place where in the spirit appears. Hallelujah. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. He showed me our new home <laughs> and it was coming here. And all those who choose life in the spirit have their mansion, their place in the new Jerusalem. Hallelujah. And they got it by walking God's will all the way to the end of their days. Father, in Jesus' name, empower us to choose your spirit every single day for the rest of our life to choose to walk in the spirit, your way, your purpose, your plan. Lord, bring us into it. We thank you for it and make holiness a reality in the spirit, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Well, God bless you. Thank you so much for tuning in. We, oh my, the, these sonship gifts, there, there's, I'm seeing more now than ever have before. They, they just, they're sort of unfolding day by day in a whole new dimension and level. And I'm convinced that what God is doing, he is settling us for what's coming and preparing us for our days ahead. And all the promises in this book are yes and amen. And he chooses the ones we're going to walk in. Hallelujah. You have a great week. God bless you. Walk in the spirit. Next week, same time, same place. See you here in the spirit.